Our mission is to give the gospel. Our mission is to live the gospel. And this quarter's lesson really helps us to understand what that really is about, even though it's not on discipleship or giving the gospel or evangelism. But it's about our relationship with God. So let's have prayer and then we'll get into it. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for being with us in these past weeks. Thank you for our lesson that we have each week. It's so informative. It helps us to understand the finer points of our relationship with you. And it puts the emphasis on that relationship and how it's supposed to work, the mechanism, so that we can work within that mechanism to build and strengthen that relationship that we have with you. Send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, give us wisdom and understanding, and help us also to more determined to be faithful to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what's our lesson about this week? The law. We love the law. We're Adventists. We're supposed to love the law, right? How important is the law to Adventists? I was just going to ask you, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And you answered it. Better be. Why? Any of you have built a clock or worked on one? I was just going to ask, anybody ever torn one apart? <laughs> I, I wish that I had one that I could have brought because I want you to just think for a minute. You've seen in clocks with all the little gears. As you think about that, you have a spring which puts a force and then there's a little wheel that just keeps going back and forth. And it takes about so long to stop and go back again. It's got a little plain spring on it. And it goes over and back, and around and back. Okay? And the big spring keeps putting an urgency on that to keep it going. As it turns, it's turning another gear, which turns another gear and another gear, and more gears, and more gears, and finally it turns, if you have a second hand, three different hands, at three different speeds, all exactly coordinated. How can those three hands stay exactly coordinated? How can you possibly have it where one hand turns exactly one time around, and another hand moves one minute, and it doesn't get off? It's not 61 seconds, it's 60. And another hand takes 60 minutes for it to go one notch. And every day, every month, every year, it's still exactly coordinated seconds to minutes to hours. How can it do that? How does that engineering work? <laughs> okay, there's gears in here with these little notches on, right? And then over here sits another one that's got notches interlining with those. All it requires is the combination of the number of gears on this one and the gears on this one and all the others to gear it. Because of the physical gears, it cannot be wrong. Now, the whole group can run too slow or too fast. Therefore, your clock gains time or loses time. But the, the three hands cannot get off without jumping a gear. In other words, it's designed to where it has to work. And if you wind it up, it will keep time. 
Has God done that with our world? Yes, He has. All your chemicals, your uh, different types of metals, the bacteria, air, water, all of these things have exact interactions. When they're proper, they work exactly the same. Now, we go in and we run a piece of paper through here and we bind it up. Or we stick a nail in it. And it stalls it. Or we eat the wrong thing. And we throw off our chemistry. Stay up too late at night. We mess up. So we can interact with that and either work with it and help it stay working or we can mess it up. But God has designed it by certain, and we like to call it what? Principles. Now, a principle is a concept, it's a design, and so God has designed certain things to work certain way. And if you want to write down this principle, you would call it a, a law. So the scientists and the biologists and all these people, they write laws. They you know, the law of gravity. Well, you know what? The law of gravity is not bound by the scientists. It's bound by a principle or principle. So creation was a bunch of principles that God designed into our world. We understand that part. Do we understand that the same exact thing happens in God designing to cooperate with Him. The relationship between us and God is also built on principles. And when we live by these principles, what's the benefit? What's the result? So what we need to look at in terms of the law is why is that law important? Because it's this. Jim? And we call that sin. Violating these laws. Why? Did sin, okay, we have the physical world and we have, I'll call it the spiritual world. Which one of those has sin affected? Both. Both. So what we have is that we have sin, the violation of the physical laws has messed up the physical world. Messing up the spiritual laws messes up the spiritual world, and when you mess up the spiritual world, you'll mess up the physical world. So sin has affected every aspect of our planet. Certainly the people on it. But it's messed up the physical world as well. And of course God's curse, you know, has affected the ground, it's affected the animals, it's affected the plants. I mean, what else was it besides God's curse that put thorns on a road? So basically what we're saying is, is the violation of this, messing up this, has affected everything down here. Cause to effect. Still does. So it did it initially, which the initial sin affected everything. Everything was suddenly changed. But the continual violation continues to change it. Okay? Personally 
and as a whole. So when God made a covenant, what was the purpose of the covenant? So after all of this has happened, we have the law, the principles that they're built on, we have life or death, God comes along at some point and says, I'll make a covenant. What is the covenant for? Um, What's another word for restore there? So the covenants in the Bible are all about salvation. Aren't they? The covenants are to undo the breaking of the law. It's to restore the law to put life back in harmony with the principles. To provide life instead of death. It's to eradicate the sin area. So, as we have been studying and as you continue to study in the future the covenants with Noah, with Moses and Israel, with Abraham, and the new covenant with us and so on, all of them deal with this. Every one of them. They've tried to make it clear, and I think they have done very well. That is what it's about. Now, looking at it from this perspective, what is the place of the law? Can there, be the, can there be a covenant providing this without the law? Wouldn't be possible. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Um, I'm going to have to look for a verse here and see if I can find one. won't say it the way you just said it. Um, let's see here. No, it's not that one. Okay. Well, here. Go to Exodus 19. Let's do it this way. It won't be direct, it'll be indirect. Exodus 19. Because this reflects uh, what was happening from the earlier covenant because what, do, what did we say all these covenants have in common? The end result for salvation. Okay, so what about the one with Noah? Was it about salvation? Well, yeah. Otherwise, he's wiped out. And everybody else was wiped out because they didn't follow God. And so they just came to their early demise. The same as God killing off the Canaanites and the, all of those people that failed to obey God. And he took their land and gave it to somebody that would follow him. At least sometimes. All right, so in Exodus chapter 19... Uh, verse 3, And Moses went up to God and called uh, to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and to the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and now I bore how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now notice verse 5. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, from all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words which they shall speak to the children of Israel. What was God wanting Israel to be? What two, <clears throat> what would you call them, occupations were they to fulfill to God? I just read it in that verse. So you can look in the verse to find it. Priests and a holy nation. In heaven, God says that we will be what two things? We will worship, but what will we be to him? What is it? Kings and priests. What are kings? What do they do? They rule. What do priests do? They teach. They, they bring God and people together. That's the purpose of a, pri a priest. Why will there need to be priests in heaven? No, we'll be priests or kings, is what I believe. Some will be priests, some will be kings. Kings will rule. In other words, God is going to take people from planet Earth who have been born in sin, overcome it, cannot, cannot be made to sin. Ellen White says in the book Education, that in heaven we will be secure. There will be no tree of, of good and evil on the new earth. We won't need one. There will be no temptation and there will be no possibility, she says, of sinning. Because everyone there has already taken care of that issue. And that's how we get out of here, by the way is by taking care of that situation. We refuse to sin. Refuse to follow Satan. Refuse to disobey God. So why would we do it in heaven? She says it won't happen. Sin will not arise a second time. So what we have here is we have a scenario where God picked different people at different times and made eternal promises to them. The consequence is eternal. But like in the case of Abraham, the case of Noah, the case of Moses, there were immediate things that were promised as well as the long term. So what we have with Abraham is he promised to make him a what? Great nation. And from that great nation, who would be blessed? All the world. In fact, he could have said all of the universe. Because we, some of us, sitting here, will be priests for eternity. Bringing angels who've never known sin to a closer relationship with God from our experience, which they've never had. We know things, we, we know stuff now that angels do not know. Can you picture yourself right now counseling an angel? That is so foreign to us, isn't it? But we know things about God, His graciousness, His goodness, His long-suffering, His kindness, His love, that angels don't know. The angels were not even aware there was such thing as a law. Didn't know it. They said, what? You mean, God, you've always had a law? And he says, yeah, I've always had the law. The law's always been there. I mean, the principles were established. And you can write it out as a law. Well, that's what he had problems with. He violated the principle and found out he'd crossed up on the law. So the angels were obeying God. They were living this lifestyle without knowing what the principles were. They were just living it. Um, 
I think there's people born into the world and live in the world and just live God's kind of life and don't even know that God exists. But God has so infused himself into them and they've had the attitude of following what they knew to be right. But yet they're not aware of the Christ that died for them. So it can happen, can it? The power of God. How does God do that? Angels don't understand it. Even though the angels are with us and helping us. So Abraham was receiving a covenant promise that God would make a great nation out of him, that God would, uh, if he followed God, that God would bless the entire world through his descendant. So, all of us born into this world are the seed of Abraham if we follow that covenant. Covenant belongs to us. Jesus said so. So all the later covenants, take the one with Noah. Well, he, he I'm going to destroy the earth. He, he starts out with, with Noah saying, by the way, Noah, I just thought I happened to tell you here, I'm going to destroy your world. What do you think, Noah? Well, God didn't ask that question, did he? But imagine what Noah was thinking. You're going to do what, God? Well, I'm going to destroy the whole world. But, not you. If you and anyone else will follow what I'm going to say next, you will be destroyed in it. And the only ones that accepted it, of course, were eight of them. So, go ahead. Uh -huh. Let me ask another question, kind of related. What if Noah had said no to God? God would have chosen somebody else. Was God going to destroy all of humanity? No. So if one person turns it down, God just goes to another. God's will will be done. Right? So I can either accept the part that God has chosen me to do, or I can reject it. I'm the loser. God doesn't lose. Except he might lose me, but his total plan, he never loses. So don't think you can manipulate God. It doesn't work. We talked about not being able to manipulate Satan either, but especially God. All right, so in a covenant, in these covenants, I want to think a little more about the covenant. Give me some other words for covenant. Agreement. Could be in the form of a contract. Are there many kinds of agreements? Give me examples of kinds of agreements. Could be verbal or written, but think of it in terms of what they would cover. Okay, could be property. A marriage, business transaction, okay? Don't they all have unique aspects to them? Do they all have the same time frame? No. Do they all have the same number of people? Do they all have the same number of partners? Um, then what is the difference between God's covenants? How is that one unique? Okay, God doesn't change. So, so we said there's business agreements, property agreements, um, um, marriage, can those break down? 
Why? So here's God's covenant, and it can break down because it's the human element. In all of these, is there a common denominator as to who initiates the covenant? <laughs> okay, that's true. With the covenants between God and man, who is the common denominator initiating the covenant? Always? Have there ever been covenants made the other way? Give me an example. Oh. <laughs> uh huh. Guy sitting in a foxhole, or he gets arrested, or, 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 and suddenly he's ready to start making an agreement. Now, what would those agreements be motivated by? Fear? Advantage oneself, get them out of trouble. Whether it's a foxhole or a punishment, guilt. What motivates God's covenant? Well, that's quite different Anne, from the others that we've named. How does that benefit God? Or is this totally unselfish? If, God, if, if man initiates a covenant, he's in a foxhole and he's afraid he's going to die, he's afraid to stick his head out of the hole to take a shot for fear his head will be blown off first. So he makes a covenant with God, you get me out of here and I'll do whatever. All right? That's based on his fear. He's protecting himself and he says, God, I'll promise you that I'll do something for you, whatever it is, I'll do something for you, but I'll, I'll get even with you. I'll, I'll pay you back. God, on the other hand, initiates a covenant. And that covenant, we said, is out of his love for us. Okay? So, because he wants to save us. What's God's benefit? I'm, I'm trying not to say it sounds like a selfish God. He wants something for himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think God is selfish? Quote, I, the Lord thy God, am a What does that tell you about God? Is that a positive or a negative? this is the universe and God has provided everything that's in it you can take and put planet earth here entire solar system right there and they're all over the place and he provided all of it everything in it he created them can you call him selfish in the negative way to say, I don't want to lose it. I love it. I made it for its own purpose. Did God need man? He, he had others. So who did he make man for? 
for his pleasure and for ours. Because everything God creates, especially when they're intelligent beings that can interact with him, they're just more beings that get to appreciate him. The more children you have, the more people can appreciate you if you're a loving, kind person. So is it selfish to have a child that you want to raise for God and raise in a proper way? Is that selfish? Because you have more children that you can love? Not at all. Then you're unhappy. So you're running that risk. So what we think of selfishness in the negative light is not God. His selfishness, if we want to think of it that way, is he wants everything here because he has everything to give. You don't have it if you don't get it from him. So only by receiving from him are we able to have and to enjoy. If he were not selfish in that sense, there sure wouldn't be salvation. And we'd all be lost. I need a jealous God. I need a guy, God that is selfish for the things that he created and loved. And he wants them to continue receiving all of that. Don't you? I need that kind of a God. Everything. Anything. Yeah. That makes him worth serving, doesn't it? Now when I see this broken law, and I'm the one that broke it, and I look at all of this and I say, whoa, I'm passing right through here, but he's given me an alternative to have salvation. I'm like, whoa, I can't get this anywhere else. So, you know about life. Um, I think you're all old enough to be of the old school. A young fellow grows up and he's full of testosterone and there is nothing that can keep him from looking at girls and he's got this ambition in life that he's going to do this and he's going to do that and he's going to have him a family and he's going to have children and he's going to love them and he's going to take care of them and provide for them and he just goes out and, and if he has to, he bulldozes his way out of the house and he says, I'm going to find me a woman. So this man hunts around and he looks at woman after woman after woman and finally he finds the right one and he says, she's going to be a part of my life. I've got all these plans for my life and I've picked a woman and she's going to get this. I've got something to give her. I've got something to offer her. And he initiates that. He's an aggressor. He goes out after it. He decides that he should do that. Go to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to show you a verse that you know very well. Just got to see it in the light of this. Genesis 2. Somebody read verse 24 for me. Genesis 2. Yeah, wait a minute. I've got the wrong verse here. There you go. Who's hunting for a partner here? The male or the female? He is. Yeah, because we live in a cockeyed world, don't we? Mm -hmm. So therefore shall a man leave. Now that says you've got to start a new nucleus. You left this nucleus family that you're in. You've got to leave that, get out, and start your own. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that command or statement of a woman. It's just not there. Now you think of the woman... The woman is born into a family with a father. He is her protector and provider. Yes, mother helps in 
training and teaching and loving and all of those things. But the Father is the provider and the protector. Now think of those two terms. Provides, food, house, clothes, place, family, friends. He is the provider. Protector. I would hate to think of reading a story where a couple wakes up in bed in the middle of the night and there's an intruder and he punches her in the ribs and says, I'm not going out there, get the gun and you go. Wouldn't you want to just twist his neck a little bit? <laughs> the father, <clears throat> that woman's father, is the protector. What do you need in life besides provisions and protection? Isn't that the core of everything? You can't live without those two? Love is there too. Yep. That, yeah. But you can't get love if you're not protected, you get killed, or if you're not being provided for. Love does those two, doesn't it? Okay? So, Nowhere in the Bible does it say a woman should leave her father and mother and go find a man. Just not there. In fact, um, I remind you of a story um, that's in the Bible. Because, see, the man is supposed to have, particularly thinking of biblical times, land and maybe he had servants. He had a lifestyle, meaning he's a shepherd, he's a farmer, he's a this, he's a that, he's whatever, something else. So he has a lifestyle. Genesis 24. This just is one of those many examples in the Bible of this happening, but it's a primary one. Genesis chapter 24, and somebody read verse 58 for us, please. Think about that. Go where? To another country. To be with who? Somebody she's never met. Pardon? She'd met the man she's going with, but not the man she's going to spend her life with. See what I mean? So, here, here's this example. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. That means hang on to, be attached to. But here, they go to Rebecca and they bring her out of her bedroom and they say, Rebecca, you know the story. You've heard all of this. Are you willing to leave this family, leave your father, leave your brothers, leave your sisters, leave, leave the lifestyle you've had and go live a whole other life? in a whole other place with somebody you've never met. Linda's fidgeting. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? It would be tremendously incredible. I, and I think she did. Yes, but usually it was nearby. It wasn't and he was a relative. But the point being is she's leaving home. She's leaving everything she had except her servant, her servants. One place that says her maid, another place that uses plural. So other than that, she took her personal belonging, it's another word. So they were quite well to do if she had servants. Uh, She's taking her clothes, she's taking, you know, whatever. And heading across country to another country to start a whole new life with a man she's never met. Now I want you to get this picture. A man has a life. He invites a woman to come and leave her life 
and become a part of his life. You did that? Or she did that? You did that to her? So Linda, you know what this <laughs> In this case, Isaac wasn't smitten, his servant was. <laughs> Now, I, I really want you to bear down on this concept that the man has a lifestyle, he has possessions, he has authority, he has his life. The woman leaves hers, which is her father, her family, and comes out, leaves all of that behind, and joins to him. Doesn't mean she loses contact with him necessarily. Rebecca didn't exactly have a telephone to communicate with him, so she was really leaving, leaving. And she takes on a whole new life, completely different life. Maybe the guy's ugly, who knows? <laughs> so the man is the head, he's the leader, the initiator, she's coming in to be his helper. He's offering his life for her, she's the receiver of a new life. Now I want you to keep these qualities in mind of each of these two parties. The man sets the direction of life because he has his occupation, he has his land. That's where life is going. Where she comes now to participate in that. He has the career, a life work, a calling. She's coming in to accept that. Because she's going to be a mate with that and help. So the man's life is augmented by her involvement. Uh, she's an assistant to his purposes. She does the things the man cannot do, such as bear the children and a lot of the training. Uh, she's the one that's going to help expand the family. He can't do that alone. The woman, on the other hand, she has a new life, new purposes, new direction. Uh, she's having these children for him. She's passing on his lineage, not hers, his, because it's his family, it's his property, it's his history, his lineage. Her name gets lost for the most part. She's losing her father's estate, but she's becoming a part of her husband's estate. By the way, anybody know someone by the name of Ivana? Have you heard that name before? Ivana. Do you know an Ivana? Who, Linda? Do you think of one? Ivanka, that'd be Trump's daughter. Okay. 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 I don't have no idea who that is. I know an, I know of another one though. Anybody know of a Marla? Which one? Which number? Number, num number two. Boy, you guys are really informed. Number two. Mar uh, Ivana is number one. Anybody know a Melania? Now, number three. Now, think about this, folks. Think about this. Trump is Trump. Trump started out as a young man with a little money and has developed a fortune of about 2.4 billion, they think. He has been a businessman around the world, developed all kinds of things. He has an empire. He was in uh, show business for years successfully and was president of the United States successfully. Probably one of the best presidents we've ever had. 
I find it interesting that two of his wives you don't know. Why? Because when he came into his own, they were not there. Two of his wives were foreigners, by the way. Marla was raised right down here in Cahutta. Uh -huh. there's, there's a street named after it from her family. We were just talking about how the wife becomes a part of the husband's life and everything about him. Ivanka is only known and popular because, I'm sorry, Melania, because of the man she married. The wife of the President of the United States. And she will always be remembered for that. The other two will never be remembered for that. She was first lady. May I suggest she, a foreigner, for four years, was the second most powerful person on earth. Now you may or may not agree that presidents wives are that powerful, but I think they are. She's the one that told Trump before he decided to run, if you run, you will win. That's what she told him. Now we only have a couple of minutes left. I'm sorry. I'm okay. Here's where I'm going with all of this. This covenant is about the God of the universe who created everything by principle. He has an empire. He has his world. He has his goals. He has his life. You can either be a part of it or you can just check out. Two other women were part of Trump's life and threw it in. And another one took their place. Is that very different from you and I and our relationship with God? God is the one that has his universe. How much universe do you have? When you die, they're going to strip you of everything but one suit of clothes and a box. That's all you're going to be. Or, you can have this, through this. That's what this is all about. This is his lifestyle. This is how God lives. This is how God reigns. This is how the universe works. And if we can't figure this out, this covenant means nothing. Because this is who he is. We are that wife that gives up everything we've had, all of our previous contacts, everything, and we come in, co in covenant with God and say, I want to be a part of what you're offering. Am I making any sense? Is this big stuff or what? It's everything. I don't know what the arguments were with the previous two wives of Trump's. But there may have been times when some of them have said, it would have been nice to have been first lady. Now, I don't know what it has to do with, you know, if you can't live with a guy, you can't live with a guy. You know, whatever it is. My point for us is, God's covenant is asking us to give up everything we know in this world. Everything. Let it all go. And be joined to him and accept a whole new life that provides way more than home can, the old home can provide. When Rebecca left home, was there any promise that her father and her lineage there would give her universal intergalactic fame? But she has it now. We're going to go to heaven and read the history. And Ellen White refers to reading the history of this world. Isn't that interesting? 
we're going to read the history of some of those details that the Bible doesn't give us. How somebody gave up something, but it all dead-ended. Everybody else dead-ended. Esau dead-ended. Jacob's did not. Rebecca's did not. And on and on it goes. Marla's life, I keep getting the wrong ones. <laughs> I know all three of them, I keep, Melania. Melania's history will always be that she was first lady. She never can lose that title. When you and I accept Christ, we never lose the title of being sons and daughters of God. Is the law important? Well, guess what? The law was important enough that he had to have it to create a universe. The law was important enough that when it isn't followed, death results. It's important enough when God didn't want us to die and he wanted to preserve us in his universe, he offered all, everything he had, including himself, and died on a cross to give you the inheritance in his kingdom. That's the importance of the law. Now are there any questions? Next week. Yes, we will. I hope so. I haven't looked at the next lesson, but I hope so because there's... There, yes. And... I, for, for years, Jim, I was known as Dale's brother. So I understand that. I understand that. <laughs> and that was okay, actually. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for loving so much that you would give everything required to give to us everything that you have. Bless us as we think about, contemplate, and choose if we want to have an eternal life or if we want to be eternally damned and lost. Bless us on the remainder of this day that we may continue to grow and understand more about you and how we can be a part of your inheritance that you've offered to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.